switch slides real quick. I was joking with Nicole that um, I inherited her office. And uh, now I'm, so I was following you in the counseling department. And uh, now I'm doing the same thing. I'm following your, your coattails up here. So well done. So my name is Nathan Trulistner. I am in a counseling faculty here at MCC. And I get the privilege of talking to you about debt and stress, and Nicole talked about how, like, who's excited for student loans? So, who's excited for stress? Anybody? No? Okay. I know, stress is not the most fun topic, but um, it is important, and we are seeing all-time highs of stress right now. So, the APA, American Psychological Association, they just released a new survey in October this month. Um, on stress in America, and here's their opening statement. Um, the report shows a battered American psyche facing a barrage of external stressors that are mostly out of personal control. The survey found a majority of adults are disheartened by government and political divisiveness, daunted by historic inflation levels, and dismayed by widespread violence. So. Not only is money a stressor, we have all these other things. There's war going on. We just came off a pandemic with COVID. Stress is at an all-time high. Counselors are seeing it uh, across the nation. And so here's a little breakdown for you, kind of by age, um, 18 to 25-year-olds. Uh, money is the top significant stress, right? Then followed by the economy and housing. And we see it even higher for people uh, 26 to 43. So starting off, we're just looking at some stats just to kind of paint the picture of how you're not alone. Everyone's dealing with stress right now. Um, according to the APA, 65% of people said money is a significant source of stress in their life. A study from the Royal College of Psychiatrists found that half of all adults with a debt problem also live with mental illness. 61% of the American public are living paycheck to paycheck right now. So as Nicole was alluding to, just getting by, right? Not able to focus on future things because they're just focused on paying their bills off each month. 13% of Americans spent more money than they earned in the past six months. Um, and when I was in college, like I worked full time and I went to community college. You know, I know the associate degree is supposed to be two years. It took me like three and a half. Um, I was a little slow, but you know, I, I got there somehow. But at the time, I was making probably less than 25000 And I thought, if someone makes $100,000 or more, to me, that was like a millionaire. I'm like, if you make a hundred to 150000 you got it nice, right? This statistic from the same survey was kind of surprising. The biggest increase of people living paycheck to paycheck is people making 100 to 150,000. It went up 11 percentage points. Uh, so it's at 52 percent. So about half the people that make this money, they're stressed. They're living paycheck to paycheck. Life never seems to slow down, right? You got housing, and cars, and bills just keep coming. You get kids. And even though you're making a lot more money than maybe you even thought or dreamed of, you realize you're still living paycheck to paycheck. All right, so what does that have to do with mental health? <clears throat> All that stress takes a toll on us, right? Stress impacts us physically, mentally. It wears us down. And the stress cycle is a good way, a good illustration of just kind of seeing this dynamic. Um, so you have a financial difficulty. You're living paycheck to paycheck, so you don't have savings or a reserve. And you get in a car accident, something unexpected comes up. This increases stress, anxiety, creating more, <coughs> excuse me, more mental health problems. This, in turn, leads to uh, not being able to pay your bills on time, struggle managing money. So it becomes a cycle, uh, you know, impacting people in increasing the, the stress load. All right, some of you might not be psychology background people, so I just wanted to lay out some of the symptoms that come with uh, stress, but specifically stress from debt. So insomnia, these are things to kind of look for. Um, 
either in yourselves or like friends and family. Uh, one story I'll, I'll share real quick before I, I give the symptoms. Um, about three years ago, I had a family member reach out to me. And he's like, hey, we need to get together. We need to meet. Um, so I was like, all right, let's meet up at a restaurant. Not the best idea, looking back at it. You know, we were surrounded by people. And, uh, you know, we both ended up basically crying. Um, but this family member opened up that they were suicidal and they were thinking about taking their own life. So I'm like, what's going on? You know, I had no idea. Turns out um, they lost their job about a year before. And they hadn't told anybody. Um, they just became depressed. You know, they uh, really the shame, I think, kept them in that place. And so I'm like, how are you paying the bills? They're like, credit card, you know, it's been mounting up. Now it's maxed out, can't use it anymore. And I'm going to be kicked out of my apartment at the end of the month. So we, of course, you know, took them in, um, gave them a place to stay for a couple months and uh, helped them get a job, get back on their feet. And now they're doing great. And so I, I thank God that they reached out um, in that moment. So just a friendly reminder that character counts and uh, how you treat people counts. Because I said, how come you didn't tell anybody? Like, you have all these different family members, and they said, I didn't think they would uh, help me. They'd understand. And so I feel honored that this person, you know, thought enough of me that if they reached out that I would help them. Um, all right, so the impact that can have on people. These are some of the symptoms to look for in yourself or friends and family uh, if they're struggling with stress and stress-related debt, insomnia, not sleeping well, uh, elevated heart rate, high blood pressure, digestive issues, loss of appetite, muscle pain, tiredness. Mental symptoms include uh, anxiety, depression, anger, guilt, shame, uh, irritableness, and again, feeling hopeless and feeling like giving up. Okay, so in doing this research, um, again, I have a counseling background, so I used to work with uh, substance abuse clients, um, addictions. So I was kind of familiar with trauma, but I didn't do a lot of research specifically on financial trauma. But it's, it's becoming a major thing. So Dr. Buck Walter uh, has done a lot of research on this, and he found that one in four Americans and one in three millennials suffer from PTSD-like symptoms caused by financially induced stress. Uh, financial trauma is characterized as a dysfunctional reaction to chronic financial stress. So chronic stress is, all right, stress is, is a good thing, right? Like if you have a test coming up, you feel a little stress. And that's a good thing because it tells your body and mind, okay, I need to go study, right? I am gonna fail if I do not study. So that stress makes you take action. Chronic stress, it never re relents. It just keeps going. It never stops. So it's a constant burden on people, wearing people down. So having debt and bills and not being able to take care of your basic needs creates this chronic stress that really is a form of trauma. Another name for this uh, technical term, acute financial stress. Um, again, some signs of this kind of financial trauma, avoidance, overspending, uh, lack of boundaries. I have another uh, quick story just showing the, the truth of this. I didn't realize it until I started working on this presentation. Um, I had my appendix removed about two years ago, and it didn't go well. I'll just leave it at that. It's a long story, but it... It spilled over, it ruptured onto my intestines, and I was in the hospital for seven days. I could not eat, um, and I was vomiting, even though I wasn't eating at all. I guess it was stomach acid just coming up. And so my, my stomach had trauma, it kind of shut down. So 
I was depressed for a couple days. Um, by the fourth or fifth day, I'm like, I need to get myself out of here. I don't know how long I'm going to be here. The doctors, they're like, you just have to wait it out. We don't know what's wrong with your stomach, but it was impacted by the surgery, and you just kind of have to wait. So I started, like, exercising and uh, listening to positive motivational videos. I'm like, I need to get my, my soul built up here because I'm heavily feeling depressed for four or five days. Finally, by day seven, I was feeling better and I was able to be released. But it actually caused uh, a form of trauma because what happens after a couple of weeks of being in the hospital for a long time? The bills start to come, right? You start to get those medical bills. And I did not want to look at it. I didn't even want to look at it. I'm like, I cannot deal with this. I'm still, I just want to move on from it. And I think this is what happens to a lot of people. There's trauma that can be attached to, to money and finances and struggles. It could have came in your childhood. It could come from lack from your family, not being able to pay bills. Um, I just had students sharing about the only reason why they had the ability to eat food was, was because their mom worked at Subway for 10 years. That was the only food they had. This creates a trauma. Trauma can be attached to, to finances. Um, so avoidance, not wanting anything to do with the cause of what it was, if it was a car wreck or, or whatever, those are signs of trauma. And when we have trauma, we have to deal with it. Um, I love this quote from Morgan Knoll. She says, while some people have been privileged to never have to worry about money, many others are used to associating money with stress, a lack of security, and even feelings of unworthiness. These negative relationships to money, formed by anything from childhood experience to long-term debt in adulthood, can be connected to financial trauma, which can in turn inform and hinder the ways that people interact with money in daily life. So at the root of it is kind of this fear, this safety issue. Like, am I secure? Are my needs going to be met? Are my, are my kids going to be OK? This is financial trauma. This is a form of PTSD that people can have. Not feeling secure, having uh, these constant nagging, fearful um, feelings. And they, they need to be dealt with. We're going to get to the solutions in a minute. So hang on there. there there's hope on the way. Um, financial stress, it can attack you three different ways. It attacks your thoughts, persistent negative thoughts, beating yourself up about past mistakes. Uh, it can be in the form of feelings, fear, worry, regret related to your finances. There's so much, in researching this, there's so much emotion tied to money. I thought it was kind of this abstract thing. No, it's your whole being is related to money and finances. Behaviors, again, avoidance and those type of things are, these are key kind of red flags to see if you might have to go dig deeper. Okay, so there's a lot of different approaches for the healing process. Um, Self-care would be huge. But everything I looked at said start with just talking about it. Just like this family member, they were on the brink of suicide, and that's actually not that uncommon when people have high amounts of debt. But I'm like, well, before you talk about it, you have to acknowledge it, right? So step one, just acknowledge that maybe you have a background with some of these issues. Acknowledge that some of those symptoms um, might relate to you or friends or family. And then step two, talk about it. Bring it into the light. Don't let it fester in darkness. Don't let shame uh, rule over you. You have to be able to, to bring it to people you trust and talk about it, and that starts the path to healing. So it could be a counselor, um, therapist, finance expert, you know, friends or family that are qualified. Um, but talking about it is the first step to deal with chronic stress, financial trauma. Third, identity. So one of the keys is going to be to separate yourself from it. Uh, it's not your identity. You're not a debtor. It's circumstantial. But if, it can feel like it's who you are. So counseling, again, might help with this. Um, 
if you need some tools, but to, to separate yourself from it and then step back and be able to get a plan. This is not who I am. I'm a successful person. Uh, I'm a, you know, affirm your true identity. And this is something that you have to deal with, but it's not weighing you down and defining who you are. Related to that, again, step four, um, I've been impressed with the research by Dr. James Pennybaker. He's shown how just writing and reflection has helped people get healing. Uh, they've applied this at colleges, community colleges, for first year students coming in, um, first generation college students, minorities. And they found that just by having these writing activities of reflecting on your past, how it's maybe influenced your present state, and then focusing on the future, those writing skills has helped GPAs go up and the drop rate go down. There's something about the writing process and just getting um, all the angst within ourselves out, outside of us. It could be through talking, but it's helpful to, to write and reflect on it. That alone can get people on the, the right track to be um, moving on and creating a plan to deal with finances. Sylvia is going to give you some amazing tools to deal with finances and debt. But the last one, again, setting goals. If you've ever taken FYE, it's amazingly important to get yourself focused, start to visualize new outcomes. Um, those of you that grew up in low-income homes, it's, it's tough to even dream about things that you haven't experienced yet. A counselor can help you walk through goal-setting activities that will help motivate you. And those motivations will then allow you to, to make the tough decisions in life, to be able to um, you know, balance your budget and make tough financial decisions because you have a dream in place, you have a focus, you're motivated, you have a plan. Lastly, um, I wouldn't be a good counselor if I didn't mention mindfulness. So mindfulness techniques can be really powerful to help ease stress, keep you calm and relaxed. Um, especially when you get triggered by bills or other financial burdens. Uh, it's something you can do in two or three minutes in your own home to kind of re reset yourself and get back on track. I didn't want to take too much time. Sylvia's coming on next. Thank you for your time. And Sylvia, come on up. as I mentioned. Thank you for all your time. Um, so I'm going to start today with a question. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Let me start with a question. Who wants to be a millionaire? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Yay, a lot of people want to be a millionaire. Well, I have a good news for you. I have a good news. It's really not that hard. It's really not that hard. There's a hope. So, I don't know about you, but when I was born, I was born prior to the microwave. We have to cook. We spend a lot of time on organizing pots and pans, cleaning them, and cooking. And that took time, persistence, and patience. Now we have a microwave, an instant society who wants to have this result very, very quick. Right? So for some of you, it may take a little bit longer. It takes time, persistence, and time, and, and uh, time, persistence, and help me out. What I miss here, <laughs> <laughs> and patience. Thank you. <laughs> so um, it's hard to build wealth if you have a lot of debts. If most of your paychecks go to credit cards, to student loans, to medical bills. Your paycheck is the most important tool and the fastest tool to build your wealth. 
So once you have all these payments, you have no toys and no tools to build a well. Did this make sense? Say yes. yes. Very good. So prior, we moved towards the strategies. I want to discuss a couple things which you're required to do. One thing what I want you to do is to pile 1,000 bucks. You've got to do this super, super fast. Sell dogs, sell cats, anything which you have around you. Pile 1,000 bucks, OK? You may say, why do I need it? Well, let me tell you. Most of the people who have not saved any money as emergency funds, once the emergency occurred, they went right away back to their debts. Okay, and I don't want that to happen to you. So promise me, say yes, that you will save 1,000 bucks. Say yes. 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 Very good, now we can move forward. So one more thing is what I want you to do. I want you to create budget. And you may say, Sylvia, dang, I try it so hard so many times, it never works. You're absolutely right, try again. On average, it takes three months for you to learn what your money going for, what you're spending for, okay? Research shows that most of us knows very well how much money we're bringing in to the household, but we often underestimate how much money we're spending, okay? So make sure you create miscellaneous column while you're creating budget. Because let me tell you, for the three months, you will have a lot of stress. You will realize and you will learn how much money you're spending. Okay, so the miscellaneous column can really help you to stay within the budget. I also want you to know that budget is a plan. It's permission to spend. It's not a restriction for you, okay? You're going to give your dollar a job. You're working too hard to be broke. Your dollars are going to work for you right now because you assigned them a job. That this makes sense? Say yes. Very good, okay. So how to make a budget? Well, just read the steps, it's that simple. <laughs> First step, list your income, then list your expenses. Step three, subtract expenses from income. Step four, track your transactions, and just make sure that you create new budget before the month begins. Any questions? Great. So now we can talk about methods. There are a couple methods I would like to share with you for today. We have a very limited time. Um, so the first uh, method is the debt snowball method. You go and organize your bills from the lowest to the highest, regardless of the interest line. And I gotta make a note on this slide because those, those debts are not yours, not mine, not, not the speakers, okay? We have created those debts for the purpose of this presentation. So let's take a look. We have an example here listed. Credit card debt of $500, minimum payment of $30. And again, in this method, I'm going to disregard the interest rates. The next loan I have is a car loan of $10,000 with the minimum payment of $150. The third, I have a student loan of the amount of $12,000 with the minimum payment of $130. I, as you can see, I have organized those debts already from the smallest to the largest. Now here's how I'm going to tackle those debts. Pay attention. First, I'm going to pay the credit cards of the amount of $500. Therefore, I'm going to pay all the minimum payments on all my debts and one thing's what I'm going to focus on, just the credit card. I will pay the minimum payments of $30, but since you have a done budgeting, do you see how important role play budget here? You going to throw additional 20, 30 bucks, whatever you have, spare money towards the credit card. Does this make sense? Say yes. Yes. Very good, okay. Then, once we pay off the credit card, we can focus on the car loan. Well, we have a $10,000, we'll pay the minimum payments of $150, but remember, we just pay off the credit card. That means we have some spare money of 30 bucks in my wallet and some extra money in my budget. I'm going to take this money and throw towards car loan. Does this make sense? Say yes. Yes. 
Very good. Okay, you guys are good students. And then I have a student loan as my last debt. What I'm going to do, I'm going to tackle the same way. Meaning I will pay the minimum payment and I will take the 150 bucks because I don't have any more car loans nor I don't have any more credit cards. Therefore, I'm going to take the $150, the $30, and all the extra money I have, and I'm going to pay it off the student loans. Is that helpful? Yes. Okay, I gotta tell you, there is a lot of research on this methods, believe it or not. Harvard Business Review found that the Snowball method is actually the most effective strategy for many people to pay debts. You go and see, a lot of progress and you're going to see very very quickly this progress so you go and pay off tackle your debts uh, very quickly with no time there is also a disadvantage to this method now the largest disadvantage is if you have a lot of non-secure loans such as credit cards or student loans hello right those are, are not secure loans meaning the interest rate is very very high on them then you're going to end up paying more interest over time. The second method and the last method is avalanche method. So now, those who love math will enjoy this method. Now we're going to pay the most expensive debts first, okay? So I'm going to organize my existing debts accordingly to the interest rate. Can you see that? Can you see my laser here? Okay, great. All right, so the highest interest rate has my credit card, right, 29%. And then I have a car loans with an interest rate of 7%. And then I have a student loans at the interest rate of 5%. I'm going to pay all the minimum payments every month and all the debts except the first one the credit card. I will put it all the extra money I have on my account, extra spare money in your budget towards the credit card. Once I pay it off, the credit card, I'm going to move forward towards car loans, okay? Make sense? Shake your head? Okay, good, nice job. Okay, car loans, right? Once I tackle car loans, I will pay, of course, my minimum payments plus all the extra money you have on the minimum payment. And then once I pay off car loan, I will fo move forward towards the student loan debts. Of the interest rate of 5%, right, I will pay the minimum payments of 130 and all the extra money you have. Well, I gotta tell you that this is a great method as well, especially for those who love math. You're going to tackle the most expensive debt first, meaning you're going to save a lot of money and interest, right? You agree? Yes? Very good. Okay. Okay. And I gotta tell you that truly, you're going to learn much more that your credit card companies are not your friends. <laughs> and you will realize how much money you pay on your interest and you will realize that they're calculating this interest for overnights, right? So there is so much what you're going to learn. Well, disadvantages. So let's take a look what type of disadvantages this method has. It really requires you to demonstrate a high level of discipline. It may take longer to see immediate results for sure, and it could be uh, challenging for many of us to stay motivated. You agree with that? Those who have tried it, they probably do. So, whichever method you're going to choose, whichever you prefer, pick one. If it works for you, great. If it doesn't, switch to the other. Don't give up. And remember, we are here to help you. We can guide you to the, through this process. And we have it done in the past Remember, stick to the budget. Make your budget fun. Create yourself fun money column, but also create yourself miscellaneous column, okay? Then set up your payment reminders and reoccurring payments. Educate yourself on debts. Remember, there is a lot of textbooks, a lot of books to read. If you're planning to be a millionaire in the future, 
you better learn how do they behave. Listen to some podcasts. There's plenty of podcasts available, and they are free. Those are a couple of my favorites, How to Make Money and the Money Nerds. And also, open your mind for the community resources. There is a couple of nonprofit organizations I have worked in the past with, Take Charge America and MoneyManagement.org. They have a plenty of free educational webinars and seminars on debt management and debt counseling. They are all open to the public. And finally, please be content with what you have, not what you could have. So thank you so much for um, let us share our experience and hope mm -hmm. and research. Um, and we would like to have your survey. Um, we would like you to complete that survey. If you can scan QR code um, and complete that survey, that would be great. And I think we are open for the questions, aren't we? And if you guys don't have a questions, we'll have a questions for you, and we are ready to give it away, those, those great gifts sponsored by our sponsors. Anybody? Uh -huh. All right, so we're going to start with maybe our questions then. Nicole, go ahead. All right, so this question will be, oh, go for it. Let me ask a quick question. Yeah. Is there any software or tool that you recommend for the budgeting aspect that is easier to use than others? Yeah, that is a really, really good question. Um, so there's a lot of public apps available currently, right? The easiest way for you probably it would be, and the most um, cheaper probably too way, right? it would be go to your website, credit to you and your bank perhaps you are partnering with or you're a member of and take a look if they have some apps available on, through their website. That way you don't have to pay the fees. Um, also, a Mint is a really good website. Um, some of us have been using in the past. I think Bianca has a suggestion. Go ahead, Bianca. You need a budget. You need a budget.com. Budget.com website? Little, you need a budget. That's what it's called. You need a budget. Yeah, why not? It's a little pricier. It's $90 a month, but it's an investment for, it, it works really well. Everydollar.com is another great one I have been using in the past too. This is a really good question. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so here you go, Nicole. All right. So my question is for you all and whoever wants to come up and grab a prize, that'd be great. Um, so I talked briefly about some of the impacts of debt on underserved and underrepresented communities. So if you could tell me three impacts of what uh, that feels like to underserved and represented, underrepresented communities. Because the truth is, in some of these spaces, even if folks need money, the stereotypes that you don't have enough or that you don't know how to manage money well makes it hard to even ask for help. Right? People say, oh, well, you, I expect that out of you. You don't know how to manage money. I remember one time, sorry, side story. I had a professor, my tuition was late for some reason, and I got dropped out of my class. And my professor said to me, well, you people don't pay your bills anyway. And this happened at a Big Ten school. Would never think that, but this happened. So the stereotype associated with this body, with this frame, is that I don't know how to pay my bills. So, impacts. Tell me the three impacts, overall impacts, of debt on underserved and underrepresented communities. Go for it. So the first one would be higher enrollment. Good. Increased emotional distress. Uh huh. And then um, the greater income inequality. This was up. Come on. Job. Yeah. All right, can we just grab one? Yeah. All right. Whatever you want to grab. I'm going to hand it over to Nathan for the second question. Yeah. I'm going to do an easy one. You had three. That's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyone can give a loose definition of financial trauma? Yeah. 
I mean, it's just trauma associated with like finance problems in the past. Like if you've been in a tough spot because you couldn't control your finances, yeah. that, that's how that's caused. Good enough, come on down, that's good. Yeah, just to help clarify. Yeah, it can be a sudden event, like a surgery, car crash, or it can be an ongoing issue, right? It could be growing up in object poverty. That could lead to trauma. So it could be a long-term thing or it could be a, a sudden event. Good job. Good job. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, so I have a question um, on two methods. Give me a two methods that you can choose from to pay off or strategies to pay off your debts. Go ahead, Bianca. The snowball method and the Everest method. Very good. Go ahead and grab yourself whatever you want. All right, so another question. Prior to coming out with idea what kind of method works for you to pay off your debts, what shall you do? There are two things I pointed out prior to pay off your debts. Do you remember? Do you remember? Yeah? Yeah. You're shaking your head, so I'm assuming. Yeah. Do you remember? Well, it's an no. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Try it. Yeah, and we do have a template in a free resources for you on the back, so make sure you grab a book on the way out. And the other one was? Rainy day farce, emergency. Okay, you go ahead and help yourself, Joy Deleuze. You go ahead and help yourself too. It's fine, yes, great. All right, um, if you guys don't have any questions, we are very grateful for your time today. You, we hope that you have enjoyed it. And uh, we're looking forward for your feedback. So on the base of your feedback, feedback, we can create even more events for you. Thank you for letting us help you today. <laughs>